So this is chapter seven. Uh, in this chapter, we, we are in a new century, the 1800s. We have a rise of new beliefs, new ideas, and new actions taken by the United States. One of those new ideas that came around during the 1800s was the rise of cultural nationalism. What is nationalism? Nationalism is pride and joy and uh, being part of a country. So you are super patriotic, super all, all American, everything has to do with your country. You are super proudful to be part of that country. So a rise of cultural nationalism, proud to be an American. We have the rise of the Democratic Republicans. The Democratic Republicans is a party that favored education. Their belief was if we focus on education, if we educate our children, we are educating future voters. So it's better for them to be informed so that they can make smart choices when they vote because they're electorates. Um, however, not all states had public education. A lot of the northern states had it more than the southern states. Women in education. We have this idea of Republican motherhood. We have, I put little stars next to them, little asterisks, because it's a very, very important um, concept. Please make sure you know what Republican motherhood is for the test. It comes up in almost every AP test. Uh, the idea is we also need to educate women because they are raising the children. They are ra we need to uh, in educate the women so that they could raise smart children to be good citizens. So the family works all together, including the women. However, not everybody got a shot to fair education. For example, slaves were not allowed to have an education because many slave owners believed that they did not want their slaves educated because that could let, lead to rebellion. So slaves were meant to, um, were kept um, ignorant or illiterate. We have, again, education, the rise of the universities, especially in Pennsylvania. It became the first medical school. Before this time, medical treatment was very primitive. Uh, primitive means basic. They believed in the concept of bleeding. So um, when they actually bleed you dry, because that's going to cleanse your body. Yes, it was super an, um, ancient thinking. Uh, we have uh, midwives, let, which was led by women. If you don't know what a midwife is, is those people as women that help uh, other women give birth. We have a decrease of those midwives because we have a rise of physicians. So we're focusing more on medicine. So now doctors are replacing midwives for performing deliveries. We have Noah Webster. Webster should sound familiar, especially if you guys have ever had in those little red books. They, the dictionaries, they're at their, uh, it's called the Webster Dictionary. They, uh, Noah Webster came up with an, un, with the American spelling book in 1783, which was a standard, which standardized the English language. So yes, we still spoke English in America, but now it was American English. Um, that is why sometimes, and the reason that was we spoke differently was because it's a different country and we have different influences from all over the world. And that's why some words are spelled differently than they are in England, like the word gray, it's spelled differently. We have key religious beliefs. Uh, this is a time of the Enlightenment period. This is a time of changes and beliefs so that the church is in the center of the world. We have the rise of deism, which basically means God exists, yes, but it created a universe and then stepped back. So they still believe in religion. They still believe in God, but it's, but they don't take they don't believe that is that that God is in your everyday life. That he just he created the world and then he stepped out. So deism. Well, um, Thomas Jefferson was a deist. We have unitarism. They did not believe in predestination. This was a big, big deal. If you guys remember last year when you guys learned about indulgences, where people would pay to get their their sins forgiven, um, which favored the rich. This uh, unitarianism was they got rid of the predestination, basically meaning everybody is uh, everybody is allowed to to uh, go to heaven. Anybody could go to heaven, and this concept uh, was very popular with the Americans because remember, um, all men are created equal. That was in our constitution. That was in our um, Declaration of Independence. So that that aspect of unitarianism was very American, uh, and the belief that Jesus was a person, not the um, not the Son of God. So basically, humans are not the devil. Uh, human, humans, human beings can also be good. So power to the people. We have religion in the late 1800s. Uh, it was low 10% of, of white Americans were part of an organized religion. Uh, that number started to increase with the rise of the second. So the, there was a there was another attempt to bring people back to the church to increase that 10%. To increase that 10%. Uh, and that was done through the Second Great Awakening, where individuals must reconnect with God. 
Uh, the effects of the Second Great Awakening was uh, we have this giant group meetings in parks and in public settings, like the picture to the left. Those uh, people gathered in parks and hear the words. The modern equivalent of that would be, have you guys ever seen the TV shows on, on TV where they have this big giant churches and a, and a preacher is uh, reaching a lot of people? That's the modern equivalent of that. It helped inspire the reform movement of the 1830s and 1840s, like abolition, the end of slavery. So thanks to the Second Great Awakening, we have us, a lot of people, asking to end slavery. Other parts of this industry, of this chapter, of this time, is the steering of industrialism. Remember, the Enlightenment period was not just about beliefs and ideas. It was also about industry or about um, how people make money. We have Samuel Slater. He became known as the father of the factory system. He was an English business person that came to America. Um, and when he came to America, he sneaked out plants for creating factories the same way that they built them in England. So remember, England, um, the United States, there was, a, there was an industrial revolution in England first. And then we had ours in America, thanks to, um, and partly due to Samuel Slater. Very, very popular. We have, the, we have Eli Whitney, another another American. He invented the cotton gin, the picture down at the bottom of the left-hand corner. The point of this was to reduce time needed to separate cotton from the seed. So if you guys have ever seen a cotton plant, it's tied to, um, the cotton is tied to like um, the seed. So people would literally, people, what, what I mean by people is slaves. They would literally pick the cotton and take away the seeds. This process would take hours and hours and hours. Um, and now with the cotton gin, this machine did it for you, thanks to the Industrial Revolution. Eli Whitney invented this machine, meaning to reduce slavery. So like now that you don't need all those slaves picking your cotton or taking away the seed, you now, um, we don't need slaves that much. But in reality, it did the opposite. It led to a huge explosion of slavery. So know that the cotton gin led to an expansion of slavery. It helped connect the agricultural south with the textile north. So they pick the cotton in the south and they make clothes with it in the north. So where the, the regions are getting more connected. We have interchangeable parts, uh, which produce identical parts for a weapon. So back in the day, everything everybody was just kind of making things on their own. So not, not two things were the same, no two things were the same. Uh, thanks to interchangeable parts, if you, for example, you had a gun and a little screw breaks, now because there was everything was the same, they had identical parts, you could just go to a store and buy that same part to fix your gun instead of having to buy a whole other gun because there's nothing to it. It applied to other industries. Um, we're going to learn about that later on. We have Robert Fullerton. He sailed up the Hudson River. It helped promote steamboats and transportation. So steamboats was a, was a rising transportation method during this time. Jefferson as president. So at this point, um, George Washington was did not belong to a political party. Um, right after that, we have John Adams. John Adams was a feder a Federalist, and then right after him, we have the the Revolution of eighteen hundreds, where Thomas Jefferson and John Adams were competing for president. Uh, eventually, <clears throat> Jefferson won. <clears throat> so we have a trans. The reason it's called the revolution is because we move from one party to the other peacefully. So it was a transition of power between the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, which was Jefferson's party. Um, so even though Je uh, the Federalists got out of power because Adams lost, the Federalist policies remain. And we're going to learn how that's going to be a problem later on. We have patronage. Uh, it provided government jobs to party members and supporters, um, and it helped Jefferson win his second term. So basically, like, he got his buddies to be part of uh, his, his agenda. So people that helped him get the election, people that gave him money, he got his supporters to, uh, he, get, he gave them jobs. So we see a lot of that today still happening where you get your, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. So trading political jobs for money. Uh, Democratic Republicans wanted to reduce the size of the federal government. We're going to see how that's a little hypocritical um, based on Jefferson's old terms. They wanted to cut back on the military and the fear of a large standing army. So they didn't want a big government, big army, because that could, seem problemat that could seem problematic in the future. The problem with that was the Barbary states, which were basically pirates who kidnapped the Americans um, and caused a big problem for the Jefferson administration. So all those Americans that would be out in sale, they would be sometimes captured by Barbary pirates, um, and we had to pay a ransom to get them back. So that was a problem in Jefferson's administration. We have the Marbury versus Madison case. 
<clears throat> Jefferson, who was not president, refused to allow Marbury, a judge, one of the, remember the last chapter, the midnight judges that Adams appointed after he lost the election, he just got a bunch of federalists into power. So, uh, so Jefferson would not allow Marbury to serve. Uh, the Supreme Court stated that Marbury was entitled to be judge, but they could not, but they could not enforce it. So the significance of Marbury basically is, I know that Marbury is very, very important, so please know Marbury versus Madison. The significance of it is that it established judicial review, which basically means that the Supreme Court can declare federal laws on Constitution. So whatever um, law that states or Congress passes, the Supreme Court has the final say. And it gave the judicial branch more power. We have doubling of the nation. We have the Treaty of San um, Idelfonso of the 1800s. France regains the Louisiana Territory, so the green section in the middle of the map on the right. The U.S. wanted New Orleans, so they sent uh, two men, Livingston and Monroe, Monroe was future president, to buy Louisiana. The purchase did happen for $15 million. We were, we were, they were sent to only buy a small portion, Louisiana, New Orleans. But they ended up coming with the whole Louisiana purchase. So if you see on the map, everything in dark green was purchased. They only meant to buy, to buy Louisiana, but they ended up with all this. And we bought it back from Napoleon, who was having financial problems. That's why we bought it for $15 million. So we doubled the size of the United States. Was the purchase constitutional? Under Jefferson's, remember, he was all about small government and strict interpretation of the laws. This is why I say he's a little hypocritical. They, under Jefferson's strict interpretation, no. The United States did not have the power to buy that land. But the Louisiana Purchase caused Jefferson to switch from strict interpretation to loose interpretation. So that was the, the, the hypocritical part. He, he was always about small government, strict interpretation. But now with the Purchase, he was all for it. This is ironic because the Federalists were against loose interpretation. So they feared a new land would be made up of Jeffersonian farmers. So Federalists did not want this land because it was Jefferson who purchased it. So they feared that um, that the new land would be filled with his people, his um, giving him the his party the more the more power. So limiting the Federalist powers. We have the Asu Junto, which some England Federalists wanted to secede, saying, well, this guy, Jefferson, is really h hardcore. We don't like him. We don't want him to be in charge. So let's let's secede. Let's not be part of the United States anymore. They attempted to lure Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr was a, was a, um, what's it called? She, he was the vice president at the time, but it did not, but he did not do it. Aaron Burr was just a fun fact about him. He was the one that killed Alexander Hamilton, the guy that created the financial system and the Bank of the United States, in a duel because Hamilton helped keep Burr from becoming governor of New York. So he dueled him, he called him out, and he ended up killing Hamilton in a duel. He traveled to he traveled to he traveled to uh, the Southwest and wanted to take over land from Spain and become president. So he did switch sides afterwards, but he never became president. We have the expansion of war. This is going to be very, very important in future lessons. We have the Berlin Berlin Decree, which Fr France and England during this time, if you remember last year, were having a lot of problems. They were fighting each other. So France forbade Europeans to trade with Great Britain, and they would capture U.S. ships that traded that treated with, with Britain. So they violate the U.S. neutrality. Remember, we were neutral during this time, but uh, under the Berlin Decree, France didn't care. The orders in council, um, all goods being traded with Europe must stop at Great Britain first. This violated again U.S. neutrality. So both France and England were getting their problem, were getting us involved in their in their in their drama. They both violated the U.S. rights and neutrality. Uh, one of the more reasons why we didn't like the British was impressment. No impressment. No impressment. The British policy of searching for U.S. ships for deserters. So during the war, a lot of people would leave in the British side. So they would stop any ship, including American ships, U.S. ships, and look for those deserters, those people that would jump ship. And once they got on, they would force U.S. men to join the British Navy. So they captured our people and made them fight for their side. Again, this was not nice. This made Americans very angry. We had the Chesapeake Leopard, uh, Leopard Affair, where the British attacked the U.S. ships and killed three and wounded 18 Americans. This again made the US very angry because they were having their own problems, they were going through their own stuff, and they were getting our um they were getting America in the middle. We were neutral, we don't want to be part of it, but we were still there. 